Hello and welcome to the second lesson on networking and networking technology. Today we're going to talk about wireless networks and encryption. So this is what we're going to learn all about Wi-Fi technology, advantages and disadvantages, uh, the frequency and channel of Wi-Fi, the importance of encryption in Wi-Fi, and just a general discussion about public-private key encryption. So wireless networks. Wi-Fi is a common standard for wireless networks. It's the one we use in homes and offices all over the world. Uh, as we know, all sorts of devices can make use of Wi-Fi connections. Laptops, tablets, smartphones, video games, e-readers. Pretty much every device nowadays is connected to Wi-Fi. It can interface with your router. It can connect to the internet. That even includes things like fridges, um, electric meters, all sorts of things. So why do we like to use Wi-Fi? Well, it's easier and less expensive to set up than a wired network. If you watched the last video, you'll know that partial and fully mesh networks are quite expensive in a wired system because you need all the cables and switches. If you've got a wireless network, you don't need any of that. You just need a router somewhere, an access point, and then you're good to go. It's convenient to use as users can move around with their devices. It can handle a large number of users at once. Again, you don't need to keep adding cables. You don't need to keep adding switches. You can handle lots of users from one device. There are disadvantages, of course, though. Speeds are slower with Wi-Fi than they are with a wired network. If you've got a really good Ethernet cable connected through to your router, you can get really good upload and download speeds. With Wi-Fi, you're never going to get quite as good. You're always going to get some interference. You're always going to get some lost packets. And you're also going to be sharing that Wi-Fi connection with other users. So you're never going to get quite the full speed. It also relies on the signal strength to the wireless access point. So you've got to be close to the wireless access point. And you can't have any interference. Signal can be obstructed. Uh, walls, depending on what they're made of, can block signals. Distance as well can weaken your signal. You've also got interference from other networks. If you're in a uh, large block of flats or an apartment block, and lots of people are using Wi-Fi, they've got the router set up, you can get interference across between the different routers that can mean you don't get such a good signal. It's also less secure than the wired network. With a wired network, unless somebody has actually access to the cable, they can't get at that information. With Wi-Fi, you're just sending your signal out there, and it's possible that somebody with a device can receive that signal and could possibly use that information. Although, of course, that's not usually a problem nowadays because the signals are encrypted, and we'll look at that a little later on. So here you can see a problem we're all familiar with. We've got our router downstairs. If your laptop is close to it, you get a really good signal, uh, really good upload and download speeds. As you move around the house, the signal strength gets less and less and less. It becomes more patchy. The signal comes and goes. Sometimes you can download YouTube videos. Sometimes you can't. It all depends on what's in the walls. It depends on the distance. So again, Sometimes we need to install boosters or other technology just to make sure we get good reception everywhere around the house. And of course, here's again a picture illustrating the security. Uh, we can see some people using their mobile devices. Of course, somebody with the right technology can try and receive that signal and then possibly use it to do criminal activities. All right, let's take a look at a bit of the background. Let's get a little bit more technical. Let's look at frequency and channels. So Wi-Fi uses uh, electromagnetic radiation, the part of the electromagnetic spectrum that we call radio waves. Signals are transmitted on a certain frequency, usually around the 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz wave bands. And that's true in most countries around the world. Each frequency is given a channel number for convenience. So in the same way that your radio stations all have channels, like in the UK, we have Radio 1, Radio 2, etc. We like to give Wi-Fi frequencies a channel 
Again, it's just easier to learn. It's easier to remember. So here we can have a look at the different channels around the 2.4 gigahertz channel. Uh, you can see channel 6 operates at 2.437 gigahertz. And certainly channel 6 is a lot easier to remember than 2.437 gigahertz. Another reason we like to use channels is, of course, the, is they don't operate at exactly one frequency. They operate at a range of frequencies. So again, if you look at channel 6, we can see it operates across a 22 megahertz uh, gap. And all the other channels do the same. They all operate over that 22 megahertz. So not operating at exact frequency. They do have a bit of a band there. And again, that's why it makes channel numbers kind of nice and easy to remember. So you can see at 2.4 gigahertz, we've got between channels 1 and 14. Typically, we don't use channel 14. It can interfere with some other services uh, further up the spectrum. And often we like to use channels 1, channel 6, and channel 11. And that's because you'll notice there's a lot of overlap between the channels. So you look at channel 2, it kind of overlaps with channel 1, channel 3, channel 4. This can cause a problem, because if channels are overlapping, they can cause some interference with each other. Channel 1, channel 6, channel 11 don't interfere with each other. So a lot of routers are just automatically set up to operate at those frequencies. And that way you don't have to worry about interference. Nowadays, of course, uh, modern routers are able to kind of scan through a range of channels and try and choose the channel that's best that doesn't have interference for you. You don't really have to worry about setting that yourself unless you really want to get into the nitty gritty of it. So again, we can get interference and data corruption if adjacent signals are being used. So you can imagine a situation where you're transmitting on channel 3, your neighbor is transmitting on channel 2, uh, another neighbor is transmitting on channel 4, your signals could interfere with each other and you would not get such a good connection and you wouldn't get such good upload and download speed. And of course, in order to communicate, two devices must be transmitting and receiving on the same frequency. So your laptop and your router in your house have to be operating on the same frequency so that they can communicate. All right, let's look at a very important subject when we're talking about this, which is encryption. So due to the vulnerability of wireless signals being picked up by an unauthorized individual, it is necessary to protect the data on a wireless network with some form of encryption. So encryption is just transforming a message, transforming data so that it can only be understood by the intended recipient. If anybody else receives the data, it's just gobbledygook. It's not understandable. This, trans sorry, this transformation normally involves a data item called a key. If we look at an older example, an older way of transmitting and receiving data in a secret way was called the Caesar cipher. And that dates back to the days of ancient Rome. Letters are displaced by known amount. For example, using the number 4 as the key, uh, the alphabet would change as follows. A would become D, E would B would become E, C would become F, and all the way along at the other end, X is A, Y is B, and Z is C. So therefore, hello would transform to Kur. Of course, if you know the key, you can transfer it backwards and forwards quite easily. With modern computers, however, of course, you could easily break this kind of uh, cipher. Uh, you wouldn't actually use that in the real world for sending and receiving sensitive data. Uh, modern computers can try out billions of different combinations or keys every second, and this wouldn't last very long. Wireless networks that we use today scramble the data into a ciphertext, a secret code, using a master key created from the wireless key. And that's really the password that we use. It can be sent using the key in a ciphertext, and then it's decrypted using this password. So, for example, when somebody comes around your house, they want to use your uh, Wi-Fi, with their mobile device, you need to give them the password that they can enter, and that allows them to send and receive encrypted information that is secure unless you know the master key. So 
So there are lots of different types of Wi-Fi encryption, WP, WPA, WPA2. Uh, we don't use WP anymore. It's very old. Uh, the crack is commonly known. So theoretically, you can break that and um, unscramble all the information. WPA and WPA2 are better. But even WPA2, there have been some problems recently. Lots of patches that have been to release to try and um, fill in some holes in the security. So when using the Wi-Fi encryption, you have to know and type in the password. So either you've got it on the back of the router, or your friend will give it to you, or you'll give it to a friend if you want them to use the connection. For security purposes, the router cannot transmit the password directly to your mobile device. If it did that, it could be um, somebody could eavesdrop, get on the get you have used the password and use it to see whatever you're doing, see your information, and basically decrypt all your information. But what happens when we need to use encryption for emails or using the web? I mean, if you think about it for a moment, if you want to do a secure connection to Amazon because you're sending them your credit card detail and you want to use their service, somebody from Amazon is not going to come around to your house and give you the password that you can type in so you have a nice encrypted connection between yourself and Amazon. In order to get around this, we use a method that has two keys known as the public private key method of encryption. There's a public key which is available that can be used to encrypt data but not decrypt it. There's a private key which is kept secret and can only be used to decrypt messages. Only the holder of the paired private key can decrypt the message. This is an example of what we call asymmetrical key encryption. This means that the two keys are different but complement each other. So again, the public key is available, anybody can use it, but it's a one-way system. It can take data and encrypt it, but it can't decrypt that data. Once it's been encrypted, uh, the public key is useless, only the private key, which is kept secret, and only that can be used to decrypt the message into a form that's readable. So we have a look. Um, with this situation. We've got Alice and Bob. Uh, Bob and Alice want to uh, send each other secure messages, possibly by email. What Alice is going to do is she's going to have a special program that's going to use some very large numbers and a complex mathematical algorithm to generate two keys, a public and a private key. If you don't know what they are, it would take even a supercomputer many years of processing to try and hit upon the right keys. So Alice has got a public and private key. The public key is made available to anybody. So Bob can use that to take his message, hello Alice, encrypt it, and turn it into a ciphertext that's unreadable. If anybody has a copy of the ciphertext, even if they have a copy of the public key, they can't read it anymore because the public key only encrypts, it doesn't decrypt. Once Alice receives it, or at least once Alice's computer receives it, she can use her private key that she keeps secret to decrypt it and see the message, hello, Alice. So that's for sending and receiving emails. But if you'd like to replace Alice with Amazon, uh, the system that Bob would use uh, to have a secure connection, HTTPS, hypertext uh, secure protocol, and use that to buy goods at Amazon, send them his credit card details in a secure manner, it would work in the same way. Amazon's public key is available. We can use that to set up a secure internet connection. So it says HTTPS, not HTTP. Often you get a padlock symbol on your browser as well. So now we're using the hypertext transfer protocol secure version. We can take our credit card detail, encrypt it using Amazon's public key. It's now secret. Anybody who encrypts it, so anybody who tries to get hold of this ciphertext, can't decrypt it unless they've got a private key. It's completely useless. We send it through to Amazon. Amazon have their private key, which they keep very secret. They can decrypt it, and they've got all your credit card and order information, and they can process your order nicely and securely. Okay, everybody, I think that is enough of that for today.
I'm going to say goodbye and good luck with your studies.